There's a passage where the Buddha describes the characteristics of things that are fabricated and of things that are not fabricated. The things that are fabricated, you can detect their arising. You can detect their change as they remain. And you can detect their passing away. As for the unfabricated, there's no arising to detect, no change, no passing away. And we remember that the Buddha defines fabrication as intention. He's saying something pretty radical. Everything you experience in your sight, sound, smells, taste, tactile sensations, ideas, is shaped by your intentions. These things change. So when you detect change, you know, there's some element of intention. Now, not all change is caused by your intention. If there's a rock slide, you can't say, well, I intended the rock slide down the mountain to happen. But your experience it will have a, an element in which you fabricated it, how you've made sense of it, how you responded to it, how you reacted to it. And the Buddha's pointing there. He's saying that everything you experience through the six senses is fabricated in this way. And it's all going to change, and it's, there's stress in the change. Which means if you're going to look for a lasting happiness, the six senses are the wrong place to look. You've got to dig deeper inside. And that's what we do as we meditate. We try to calm down our fabrications, because they're pretty active. In fact, we play more of a role in our sensory experience than we tend to realize. We go out to sense things. The Buddha talks about this as an asava, the outflow. We flow to our senses, through our sensual plans, through our desire for becoming, and just out of ignorance. Because of that ignorance, we're bewildered. Think about when you're a little kid, really small, and you're dealing with pain. Pain is why we think, why we try to figure things out. If we had no pain at all if everything were just perfectly blissful. There wouldn't be any thinking, any need for it. But we're trying to figure things out. Back when I was in school, there was a psychologist, Jean Piaget, who had studied children to figure out how they constructed their view of the world. It wasn't that they just gradually put things together bit by bit by bit and finally arrived at a worldview. They had worldviews very early on. A lot of kids had some very strange ideas of causality. And then they would begin to realize this was not working. So I'd have to destroy that old worldview and adopt a new one. And this is how we grow. Not just by increments, by, but by revolutions inside. When there's enough pain or suffering that we realize that holding on to our way of viewing the world is no longer worth it, we let it fall apart and find a new one to replace it. And we finally get to a point where we're satisfied with our worldview. So even though there may be some pain and suffering, some stress, it's good enough. I can manage. That's the attitude. But the Buddha says something better. There is an unfabricated that can be experienced. So he wants us to look at our way of viewing the world and say it's not good enough. You're putting up with a lot of pain and suffering that you don't have to. And this is why he encourages to look at the suffering inherent in these things, everything that's intended. Wherever there's change, he said, look for the element of stress there. Because when you look there, then you're going to find this fabrication. You realize you're doing something. You're implicit in that change. 
So it means you have to change your habits. This is one of the reasons why there's a lot of resistance to the Buddhist teachings. But then when you turn around and reflect, there is a lot of stress and pain in your current worldview. And when you think about it, you may be responsible for it. You're more willing to give them a, a fair hearing. This is also why he has you develop a sense of sangwega. Because people have gone through lives, how many lives, holding on to their worldviews, sometimes fairly skillful, sometimes not. And it goes nowhere. Because that's the other reason we hold to our worldviews. We figure out we can arrive at some well-being by making certain assumptions. And whatever stress is involved is a means to a better end. But within samsara there are no ends. Everything is just a means. You arrive someplace, and as soon as you've arrived, it starts eroding away. One of you lay claim to something. There's a passage where the word says, however they conceive it, it already has become something else. And so you see this, and you, the futility of the whole thing is what gets to you. It's in this way that Sangwega is much more impersonal, say, than compassion. You see beings causing a lot of suffering, and there's some compassion, but then you realize that the whole framework of being a being is inherently stressful. And it's not accomplishing anything. It's just a lot of unnecessary pain. I remember when my father was approaching death. Went back home. He was going through the last stages of Parkinson's dementia. And I could see there was a lot of suffering in his mind, in his heart. And it was hard to get in because he was demented. I kept thinking to myself, what purpose does this serve? It serves no purpose at all. And yet we keep coming back. Think of King Garavya. He's so old that when he means to put his foot in one place, he puts it someplace else. He's sick. Sometimes he has a recurrent illness, and his courtiers are sitting out waiting for him to die, basically. Maybe this time he's going to die. Maybe this time he's going to die. Amassing wealth that he knows he's going to have to leave behind. And yet, when there's an the opportunity to conquer another kingdom, he would go for it, even if the other kingdom were on the other side of the ocean. All these things that make us suffer, and yet we come back from war. So we reflect on this. So we can turn around and look at ourselves. What are we doing that's keeping this going? Because the motor is inside. This habit of the mind to fabricate things for the sake of something. But then what is it for the sake of? Well, that's, that's, that's for the sake of something else, and that's for the sake of something else. It's like an unending chain. There's no real point of arrival through the process of fabrication. The closest you can get is to fabricate a path. That's why we adopt the, the Buddha's way of looking at things, which is to turn around and look at these processes the processes by which we create our worldviews, our sense of what's worth doing, what's not worth doing, and seeing how we put it together. All the steps. How are you going to see the steps? By making the mind really, really quiet, giving it one thing to think about. Because it's only when you focus on one intention and make up your mind you're going to stay with that one intention, do you see the other little intentions that would push you away. Otherwise, we're like a, a boat floating on a river, and we have no anchor. 
and we're far from shore. So we have no clear points of reference. So currents come from one direction, they come from another direction, the boat goes here and it goes there, meanders around. And we really don't notice it. Just the way of boats, just the way of the ocean. That's what we think. But if you were to have an anchor, try to keep the boat in one place, then you start seeing, oh, there's a current that's coming from the north, or a current from the south, or waves are coming. They're pushing you left or right. So we try to get in the same way, we get the mind still. We anchor it in the present moment with the breath. And make up our minds we're going to breathe in such a way that we minimize bodily fabrication and mentalize, <coughs> excuse me, minimize mental fabrication, calm the bodily fabrication, calm the mental fabrication, in other words, calm the breath, calm our perceptions. And then we'll be able to pick up subtle things that are going on in the breath, in the body that we didn't see before, and also in the mind. We'll see the stages by which the mind creates a reaction, creates a worldview, and then reacts within it, or responds, or is more proactive. The more quickly we can pick up on these things, the more clearly we can see the steps in the process. And a lot of us, this is to see how arbitrary a lot of those processes are. Here again, there's a sense of sangwega. This is what you've created your life around, these little movements in the mind. And they're also arbitrary. So why do we keep coming back for more? You look in, you look in. See, what's the allure? What do you think you're going to accomplish? When you, it really hits home that the drawbacks really outweigh whatever advantage, whatever lure there was to those things. That's when you really let go. Now this is not sangwega, this is just passion, it's something else. It's a maturing, realizing that, oh, this is what I've been doing all along, and it's doomed. No matter how nice a world I can imagine, it's all going to fall apart. And then I have to build something out of the wreckage. And sometimes it is wreckage, and sometimes there is injury. In other words, the way we feed on things, the way we go around trying to find our happiness, sometimes we're good, we behave ourselves, we do it in a relatively harmless way. Other times, no. We're more careless. And even in the harmless ones, harmless ways of looking for happiness, there's going to be a lot of stress. As I said, when that hits home, then the mind is ready to open up to something that's not fabricated. It's going to fight all the way. It's going to say, well, maybe there's something better. Better fabrication, because that's what we're used to doing. Just keep fabricating, intending, creating something for the sake of something that we think is going to be even better. That's when the mind finally lets go, puts down all of its tools. That's when we find, oh yeah, there is an unfabricated, and we've been willfully ignoring it all this time. That's when we've really listened to the Buddha's message and gotten the most of his way of looking at things. When he talks about fabrication, it's not trees and mountains in and of themselves, even though they are constructed out of conditions. He's more interested in how you're constructing your experience of trees and mountains and everything else. And when you learn how to be more reflective like that and look at the way you're engaging in things. 
You see that it's been your engagement that's been the problem. That's when you benefited from listening to the Buddhist teachings. You have a sense not only of the Dharma, but also what the Dharma aims at, what its goal is, its atta. What it's all about. And you realize how compassionate the Buddha was to focus on these issues. After he began to awaken, he could have talked about anything he wanted to. But he saw that teaching people to be reflective on how they go about looking for happiness. So they don't do it with bewilderment, but they bring more and more knowledge to what they're doing. That was by far the best use of his time. So he used his time well. Let's make sure that we use ours well, too.